Guangzhou, an economic powerhouse and South China's largest metropolis. But the city is under threat from its own success. Rampant urban growth and over-industrialization have led to severe pollution, while the city buckles under the weight of providing power for over 40 million inhabitants. To solve this energy crisis, city planners seek bold measures and attempt building one of the world's greenest skyscrapers and constructing water recycling plants deep underground. But will it be enough to ensure the future of this boom town? Asia is booming, its population nearly quadrupled within a century. These boom towns are fueled by more than human or natural resources. Radical innovations are making them livable and sustainable. But the challenge of achieving these innovations can be tough. And the answers are never straightforward. This is Asianopolis, a city of the future that is home to millions of people. By the 25th century, all cities will be like living organisms, instinctively harnessing the power of the elements for their every need. In this future city, the basic building is the Eco Tree Scraper, a massive plant-like structure that can tap on the power of the wind and the sun from any direction. It's shaped with contours that channel wind to turbines located within the building, as well as solar panels that can morph their positions in response to sunlight. Unique structural designs maximize natural air currents to provide total climate control for thousands of residents. Although solar and wind power were already developed in the 20th century, it was the growing impact of global warming that forced engineers to radically rethink how they could integrate these technologies with sustainable climate control. Guangzhou, a booming port city in southern China. Over the last 30 years, the city has transformed itself into a major manufacturing and trading hub, following economic reforms across China. But its success has come at a cost. Power shortages crippled the city as demand for electricity soars during the hot and humid months of summer. The situation is aggravated by the fact that Guangzhou is also home to hundreds of power-hungry skyscrapers. A solution had to be found, and fast. American architectural firm Skidmore, Owings & Merrill partnered with the Guangzhou Design Institute to tackle the problem. The result? The Pearl River Tower. A radical building that is part skyscraper, part power generator, and all green. The 71-story Pearl River Tower consumes nearly 60% less energy than a traditional skyscraper and boasts an array of features to harness the power of the elements. At the core of the design are a series of wind turbines built into the very heart of this 310-meter-tall building. But incorporating wind turbines into an urban landscape is no easy feat. In a city as densely built as Guangzhou, wind flow is obstructed by the amount of skyscrapers dominating the landscape. To compound the problem, the city has a highest average wind speed of only 8 kilometers an hour, the equivalent of a gentle breeze by the beach. 
the winds are not strong enough to drive a traditional wind turbine, much less power a skyscraper. The designers hit on a solution. They decided to employ vertical axis wind turbines. Like a weather vane, these turbines are omnidirectional and require less wind to operate. To integrate the turbines into the Pearl River Tower, designers created four large funnel-shaped openings. These openings channel wind into the turbines at maximum speed to increase their efficiency. Like expressways, they also allow prevailing winds to pass through the structure, reducing wind load on the building. Having harnessed the wind, the designers turned their attention to the power of the sun. Photovoltaic cells were integrated into the building's mechanized sunshade system to capture sunlight from both the building's eastern and western facades. The Pearl River Tower's solar and wind turbine systems generate over 300,000 kilowatt hours of power. But this is not enough to power the enormous skyscraper during the searing heat of summer. With temperatures rising to almost 40 degrees Celsius during the hottest months of July and August, the energy needed to cool the building using conventional methods would be far too demanding. To tackle the problem, the team designed a unique radiant cooling system in place of power-hungry air conditioners. Cold water is pumped through perimeter beams lining the ceilings to cool the interior while a raised access floor provides ventilation using fresh air cooled by the chilled water system. With these final touches, the Pearl River Tower was unveiled to the world in 2010 and now stands as the world's most energy efficient skyscraper. The Pearl River Tower has redefined the blueprint for a sustainable urban scape and set a benchmark for a green boomtown of the future that exists harmoniously with nature. In the future, the world has perfected the art of managing resources as populations boom beyond what could previously be imagined. Nothing goes to waste as every single object is recycled. One of the most reused materials is plastic, a synthetic moldable solid first developed in the 19th century. To conserve the precious material, every household has their own portable unit that recycles all their unwanted appliances and gadgets. But back in the 21st century, the world was still grappling with the means of recycling this versatile polymer. Today, the world consumes over 280 million tons of plastic each and every year. And to put that in perspective, on a volume basis, we actually use more plastics each and every year than steel around the world. The difficulty with that is that only about 10% of the plastics we use are reused, whereas with steel, over 90%. The plastics are actually more valuable than steel on a price per weight basis. Guangzhou is China's third largest port for waste plastic imports. But without an efficient way of recycling the material, the city has no way of tapping into this lucrative gold mine, even as demand for plastic soars with Guangzhou's booming industries.
The Guangzhou Iron and Steel Enterprises Group and U.S. plastic recycling pioneers MBA Polymers partnered to take up the challenge. They set up a co-venture to provide a sustainable method of recycling waste plastic into supplies for high-tech products. Their project, a recycling plant with the capacity to process over 40,000 tons of scrap plastic in a year. Like many of our customers, most of the electronics manufacturers in the world are located within an hour radius of Guangzhou, China. So we're in the hotbed of electronics manufacturing in the world. Plastic recycling from waste electronics, however, is a complex and energy-consuming process. There are seven different categories of plastics. Like unique individuals, each plastic type has its own character makeup and melts at different temperature points. If the plastics are not sorted correctly, the recycled product is in danger of contamination, making it unusable. The engineers devised a groundbreaking solution. An automated sorting device. After the sorting process, each type of plastic waste is recycled into pellets that will be used as raw products for a variety of materials. But even with an effective means of reclaiming waste plastic, the process still poses a risk for the environment. For the polymer to be recycled, it has to be melted down, resulting in toxic fumes. Waste byproducts from plastic recycling also present a dumping hazard. The problem has become rampant in Guangzhou, where there are an estimated 400,000 recycling companies many of whom are poorly regulated. If the unorthodox recycling of plastic is left unchecked, Guangzhou runs the risk of turning into a toxic boomtown. To combat the problem, engineers at MBA Polymer designed additional features into their recycling plant. Their mission to ensure that the process is eco-friendly. Within barely three years of operation, the recycling plant is already processing more than 25,000 tons of waste plastic a year. Boasting green and sustainable waste disposal facilities, the plant also ensures that no harm is done to the environment in the process, providing Guangzhou with an extra boost in its mission to achieve sustainable development. But other waste problems threaten the future of this boomtown. In the city, hundreds of rivers crisscross the landscape providing water to the locals for centuries. But now, rapid urbanization has taken a toll on the waterways. 
making Guangzhou one of the world's most polluted cities. It would take a radical solution to ensure the city a regular supply of clean water before it drowns in toxic sludge. As the world becomes increasingly urbanized, a key challenge is providing clean water to the booming population. But in the future city of Asianopolis, the specter of a water shortage has become an urban myth. Buried deep beneath the glittering skyline is a massive bioreactor that inhabitants call the pump. Like a living organ, the pump collects wastewater throughout the city and purifies it for consumption using a combination of microfiltration and bioprocessing. Situated nearly 100 meters underground, the facility does not infringe on the scarce land space of the dense urban scape. The pump is also modular, allowing city planners to expand or customize its shape and size according to the city's growth. But the incredible technology behind the pump was already devised as early as the 21st century amid the clogged waterways of southern China. Guangzhou, the capital city of Guangdong province in southern China. Located along the Pearl River, hundreds of waterways cut across the face of the city. The abundance of water has allowed the port city to thrive, making it one of China's richest. But unchecked development has taken a toll on the city's natural resources. Faced with an impending water crisis, the Chinese authorities took action to turn the tide. They launched nearly 600 projects under the Water Environment Restoration Project to clean up the waterways. But traditional water treatment plants need space, a resource that is scarce and expensive in a built-up city like Guangzhou. United Envirotech Limited, a leading Singaporean water treatment company, took up the challenge. Their proposal, a state-of-the-art membrane bioreactor. The key component is the membrane, a microscopic filter shaped like a thread. Many membrane threads are assembled into a single filter screen that acts like a sieve to sift out microorganisms. In a membrane bioreactor, wastewater is first filtered to remove loose particles. The filtered water is then treated with active organisms to destroy harmful bacteria. Finally, the treated water is passed through a membrane filter to remove the residual organisms. A single membrane bioreactor can process the same amount of wastewater on a much reduced footprint. The engineers designed a membrane bioreactor to be built over an area of 1.8 hectares making it the smallest water treatment plant in China. The facility has the capacity to process 100,000 cubic meters of water each day, enough to fill 40 Olympic-sized swimming pools. But the plan soon ground to a halt due to an unforeseen problem. The location allocated for the membrane bioreactor sits at the heart of a residential area. The nearest apartment block is no more than three meters away from the proposed site. News of the facility sparked angry reactions from surrounding residents. To solve the problem, engineers hit on a radical solution. 
they would build the membrane bioreactor 18 meters underground. The topside facility would also be landscaped to resemble a garden to ease the residents' concerns. Construction of the underground facility began following a green light from the Chinese authorities, but the challenge was far from over. To minimize inconvenience to the local residents, the team had to finish construction of the facility in less than a year. To compound the problem, the site's foundations comprise of loose sedimentary soil that can collapse easily. The most urgent task for the team was to reinforce the walls of the underground site even as they drilled deeper into the earth. Concrete and steel rebars were carefully inserted to support the walls at every step of the process. The team's efforts paid off and the construction progressed with no mishaps. They completed the water treatment plant within just nine months. The Jingxi membrane bioreactor was successfully put into operation in September 2010. It is the largest underground membrane bioreactor in Asia the treated water is reintroduced to the surrounding rivers to clean up the waterways. This模式非常适合大城市,地很少,第二呢,你把它做到地下之后,对周边的环境没有影响。这种花园式的无水场,既解决了对周围环境影响,又给周围提供了绿地。From a megacity threatened by pollution and overpopulation, Guangzhou has come back from the brink through green rejuvenation. With sustainable skyscrapers powered by the elements and cutting-edge waste treatment and recycling facilities, Guangzhou has set a new benchmark for cities of the future and assured its own rise as one of the leading boom towns of Asia. Laog City, Northern Philippines, a metropolis on the rise. But economic success is a double-edged sword for this growing town. Streets are overrun with garbage. See the garbage just as high as those trees? Electricity is in short supply. One of the problems in this region has been a power supply which were quite unstable. Local residents and businesses are racing to solve these problems. Yung pag develop na lang yung access road ay medyo maduguna. Investing in sustainable energy and cutting edge technologies, will it be enough to ensure the future of this boom town? Asia is booming, its population nearly quadrupled within a century. These boom towns are fueled by more than human or natural resources, radical innovations that are making them livable and sustainable. But the challenge of achieving these innovations can be tough, and the answers are never straightforward. This is Asianopolis, the city of the future. It's an extraordinary projection of what life could be like in the 25th century. Home to tens of millions of people, the city is powered and sustained by revolutionary technologies. 
like this hydro turbine bridge. There are 200 of these spread out across the metropolis, each one generating 3,000 megawatts of electricity, enough to power the entire city. This ingenious idea can become a future reality, but its development starts now with innovative engineers who are working to solve the problems of today's boom towns. Loag City in the Philippines, a small yet thriving provincial capital in North Luzon. Founded in 1585, Loag City today is surrounded by farmland, quiet villages and pristine beaches. But its strategic location has allowed the town to become a center of trade and industry with a population of more than 100,000. It's on the cusp of becoming a bustling metropolis, but already Loag is being confronted with big city problems. Mega cities would require huge amount of electricity. The lifeblood of all growing societies, demand for electricity within the city has skyrocketed. But for those living on the outskirts, electricity can't be delivered fast enough. In the nearby rural area of Pagutbud, total blackouts are common. Madilim dito sa ami, mahirap ang buhay. Kaya pati mga anak namin na nag-aaral, nahihirapan dahil saka lang makapag-aral sa gabi. V plus E N equals 10. Local engineers had to generate more electricity but they knew that a gas-guzzling power plant would be too costly. They didn't have gas or oil, but what they did have was water, and plenty of it. But the overabundance of water here is usually linked to disaster. Every time na magkaroon ng uh, malakas na ulan, dito nai-stranded yung mga travelers along the road from Lawag to Cagayan, nag yan. To save the town, engineers would have to harness this temperamental force of nature. But could a source of moving water be found that was large enough to sustain a hydroelectric plant? A survey team is sent into the Pakudbud jungle to find the perfect water source by Chief Engineer Alfredo Ramos. Ang kailangan talaga dito pag magsusurve ka ay yung medyo maganda yung pangataon o kaya healthy ka kasi ang hirap umakyat sa bundok kasi matarik. After months of searching, the men hit a gold mine, a waterfall with a 30-meter drop. The team had chanced upon the Agua Grande River, which turned out to be a large and powerful source of rushing water. If a hydro plant could be constructed at the foot of the mountain, it would allow engineers to harness this power. But most hydroelectric plants today are created on a massive scale. Huge dams are usually constructed, flooding vast areas behind the plant, trapping enough water to spin large turbines. Besides being expensive to build, these hydro plants can be logistical nightmares and can cause significant environmental damage. Given the remoteness and poverty of the region, the team knew they needed an innovative answer to their problem. Their solution was to build what is known as a mini hydro plant, a new concept in electricity generation. Taking two years to complete, the plant today contains five mini hydro turbines. Itong plant na ito ay mini hydro lang tawag kasi nga the capacity of this power plant is uh, below 10 megawatts. Hindi kami nagko-contain ng tubig o nag-iimbak ng tubig sa, sa taas kaya uh, tinatawag nila itong uh, runoff river lang. Kung ano yung dumadaloy sa ilog, yun lang ang ginagamit namin na pampatakbo ng planta. The waterfall was the perfect source for a mini hydro plant for several key reasons. The water's long drop to the base of the river meant that it provided a steady flow of energy. With this constant source of powerful rushing water, a dam was not necessary. Bagsak ng tubig papunta sa turbina, dapat kailangan talaga para malakas yung pressure niya para umikot yung turbina. The mini turbines work the same way as larger models used around the world. Water moves the turbine, which turns the shaft leading to the gearbox. The gearbox accelerates the spin of the shaft, which leads into the generator, where the real magic takes place. 
Electricity begins with a spark of energy that's created by the generator. This causes tiny packets of energy, known as electrons, to start moving. A current of electricity begins to flow like a river. With the mini hydro plant in full operation, a simple test proves that all systems are go. Bye, thank you. Pero ngayon na andyan na yung mini hydro, gumanda ang buhay namin. Ayun, nakapag-aral na rin silang mabuti. With electricity now surging through the town of Packetbud, a new tourist industry has popped up near the coast, and small businesses have been revitalized. Without the need for a dam, the plant has even helped to protect the surrounding area, becoming a centerpiece for travelers and locals. Nung na buo na itong mini hydro, nahanap na, uh, naging protected area na itong lugar na ito. Uh, nabawal na ng hunting, uh, especially lagging, then also fishing. Nakabuti rin na ito sa kalikasan. Given the poverty of the region, this truly exceptional solution has created a huge impact now and for years to come. But when power supply becomes a problem, not just for a small community, but for countless boom towns across an entire province, it's time for a totally new type of technology to make its entrance at a much larger scale. This is Asianopolis, a prototype for a future megacity with populations growing at unprecedented rates, future cities need to be equipped with cutting-edge technologies that solve problems before they start. This is a supermassive aerogenerator, an electricity-making giant with a 300-meter wingspan. Though it creates enough current to power thousands of households, it's driven by just one thing, wind. This future technology is not a fantasy. Its development has already begun. Loag City, Philippines, a booming urban area that's fast outgrowing its electricity supply. Wind could be the solution to its problems, and the best place to harness it is at the nearby coast of Bangi. Danish engineer Niels Jacobsen has the tough task of getting these wind turbines to save the town from a power crash. One of the problems in this region has been a power supply which were quite unstable, very fluctuating, particularly in the northern part of the Ilocos Norte. Voltage would vary from 140 volt to 240 volt, and that has a severe impact. A fluctuating voltage can destroy electrical devices, crippling hospitals and critical services, and bring a city to a standstill. Jacobson knew that he could solve the problem by harnessing the power of the wind. But building a conventional wind turbine wouldn't work in Ilocos Norte because of one catastrophic reason, typhoons. The Philippines faces up to 20 typhoons every year, wiping out entire towns and taking countless lives. In 1991 alone, 5,000 people died in a single storm. In order to build wind turbines here, they'd have to be typhoon-proof, able to withstand anything that nature could throw at them. Their solution was to construct the wind turbines at an enormous scale. Each turbine is 70 meters tall, roughly the same height as a 20-story building. Each rotor spans 82 meters in diameter, making them bigger than the Airbus 380, the world's largest passenger airplane. Jacobson recruited the help of top engineers to oversee their construction. But even before the work could begin, nature decided to fight back. A typhoon struck just days before the first shipment of parts was due to arrive. Back in October 8, just before the turbines were to arrive, there was a severe typhoon that simply took down the temporary landing facility. Huge waves rolled into the shore, crashing into equipment. The waves created an ocean spray that was three to four times the height of the team's excavators. In the end, the company's pier was completely destroyed. A lot of the foundations that were not yet completed 
were over flooded with sand. It gave us some setback. It was a clear example of the destructive power that the weather could inflict on any major construction project. Engineers began work on new designs to strengthen the foundations, with the knowledge that the turbines would have to grow stronger roots. The turbine are constructed on a big concrete foundation. It's like 300 cubic meter of concrete. This big foundation is anchored into the ground through eight board piles that is stretching below the foundation, stretching further uh, 13 meter into the ground. This reinforcement meant that the turbines would be rooted to the ground like towering steel trees. Armed with these powerful new designs, the team successfully built 20 virtually indestructible wind turbines. At the time, they were the largest ever constructed, an astounding collection of technological achievements. Electricity is produced high above the ground, where the turbine and generator are located. The wind turns the rotor, which is connected to a gearbox. The gearbox then accelerates the spinning effect. For every turn of the huge rotor, the final unit spins more than 80 times. From there, the wind energy is finally transformed into electricity. Maintaining the system requires a team of highly skilled and brave individuals who are unafraid of working at extreme heights. The risks are multiplied by the relentless winds. For these engineers, working 20 stories above the ground, safety is their top priority. When they climb, there is, of course, a lot of safety issues involved. It's a simple ladder going all the way 70 meters. You have to wear a harness, you have to wear a helmet. If in case somebody would climb and for some reason you faint, you cannot fall down because the harness is locked to a safety wire, you are secured. Today, these 20 turbines stand like silent sentries guarding the Bangi coastline with a total rated capacity of 33 megawatts. The surge in the electricity supply has ignited an economic boom across the province. Here in Ilocos Norte, there is like 112,000 household consumers, and we supply like 50% over the year uh, of their electricity. Today, they've become an icon in the Philippines a symbol of a boomtown surging ahead. A recent international study has forecast that wind power could provide the Philippines with more than 48 gigawatts of electricity, equivalent to the output from more than 30 nuclear power plants, enough electricity to change the future of the entire nation. Asianopolis, a hypothetical future city. To cope with a growing population, future megacities like this will have to conquer one of the 21st century's most difficult urban challenges, garbage. This is a floating recycling center. It not only collects rubbish from the sea, but also converts it into usable products, turning garbage into a thing of the past. This incredible concept can trace its origins to a handful of unusual bricks crafted in the 21st century. Loag City is the capital city of the Philippines province of Olocos Norte. Though it's a relatively small city, Loag is a growing hub of trade, commerce and industry. Home to 100,000 people and growing, it doesn't take much for boom towns like this to become overrun with garbage. Anong puno ba, biodegrade? Puro ganito po to. Pwede pong pakidala na lang dyan. Ayaw, Opo, ha? Salamat. Revi Bayona from Luzon Green Art Technology is one of a handful of Filipinos who've made it their personal mission to solve these problems. Every day, more or less 12 trucks are coming in to dump garbage from 5 o'clock in the morning until at noon. Galing to sa public market siya, no? Well, right now, the main source of the garbage of the city is from the public market and then from the commercial establishments. Oh, 
The team realized that Lauag's garbage was mostly made up of two things, discarded plastics and biodegradable material. They decided to tackle the problem of the biodegradable material first. Their solution was simple, fertilizer, clean, natural, enriched soil that's critical to growing the crops that feed boomtowns. To create the fertilizer, they'd first need a base of operations and a team of scavengers with strong stomachs to make it happen. First, we organized the scavengers because we believe that they are critical partners on this program. We recover everything that we can recover, then we process it into organic fertilizer. The biodegradable waste goes through a process of shredding and mixing with carbonized rice husks. This increases nitrogen content, essential for a high-quality fertilizer. The material is then sifted through a rotating drum. The final product is a fine fertilizer that's completely organic and ready to use. Currently, we are supplying to a big farm. They pick up our products. With one problem solved, the team then turned their attention to a much bigger problem, plastics, a huge issue for boomtowns. Plastics persist for decades in landfills and are known to leak toxic chemicals into surrounding soils. They release noxious gases when burned, leaving incineration out of the question. Their solution was ingenious. These innovators found a breakthrough in something we all use every single day without even realizing it. How do we live with waste plastics? By living in them, building blocks. Cement blocks can be used to seal in plastics, preventing the escape of toxic chemicals for good. Some of the plastics are recovered, shred it and mix it with cement and uh, sand to produce concrete products. But this proposed solution came with its own problems. To be successful, the blocks had to prove themselves on the housing market, where buyers doubted the strength of a cement block loaded with plastic. At the beginning, people don't believe that we can produce actually concrete materials with the mix of plastics. People who come here, when we tell them, oh, these are our products, and then they will say, did you mix that with waste? And when we said yes, they'll just walk out from us. The foundations of a house are under enormous pressure. If the block isn't strong enough to withstand the pressure from above, it can have a catastrophic effect on the structure and the families within. To convince our customers that these blocks were as strong as any, Revy booked an appointment with Henry Gaian, chief engineer at the testing center of the Department of Public Works and Highways. Hello, good morning. Engineer, good morning. Okay. Her goal was to have her blocks certified for industrial use. But to do that, the blocks would have to withstand a minimum total pressure of 550 pounds per square inch. For starters, Henry tests a commercial block. The competition's block has failed the test and failed miserably, barely registering on the pressure gauge. There are countless reasons why the block might have failed the test, including poor quality sand or errors in the curing process. Next up is Revy's block. Ang abutin dito naman sa metro natin is uh, 70 kilonewton. Parang mamit niya yung required strength. Right. Itry na. If her block fails the test, it's unlikely that Revy will be able to sell her latest batch on the lucrative housing market. Ano dapat, engineer? 70. Oh, lampas na. Equivalent to 1,272 PSI. Yes, sir. Mm. 
1,000 na lampas na. Tinimis to na yung required mo. The success at the testing facility represents a victory, not only for Revy and Luzon Green Art Technology, but also for the entire city. Since achieving certification, the team has manufactured over 100,000 pieces of different sized hollow blocks, and various designs and colors of paving blocks. The blocks have found their way into major housing developments, industrial buildings, and even into the Laurag City General Hospital. But the biggest impact of their work can be seen at the local landfill site, where the team has eliminated 500,000 kilograms of garbage. That's enough to reduce the height of the landfill by 10 meters. Prior to the implementation of the program, you can see the garbage just as high as those trees. I believe that using low-cost technology, as long as we protect the environment, we are contributing something to make this earth happy and to make our people happy and to make the generation happy. From simple yet innovative approaches, Larrick City's foundations are set for a bright future. Powered by wind and hydroelectricity, its energy needs will be met while its waste products and natural environments are kept in balance. Larrick City is truly a boomtown on the rise, leaving its mark on Asia and changing the way we live forever. Thank you.